should be recorded now. So James, thank you very much again for agreeing to be our keynote of this talk uh, and the floor is yours. Okay, so thanks so much, uh, Sefi. This is uh, very nice to have the opportunity to talk here today. Uh, it's been a great conference so far, very impressive, uh, actually. Uh, this is, these are serious papers. Um, I think sort of for a keynote, I decided to do something kind of high level and maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit crazy. So I suspect that all of all of these authors of very careful papers um, might do some eye rolling along the way, uh, but that's probably a good thing, <clears throat> and um, I'm hopeful to get some good uh, good feedback. So let me just confirm as we get going, you should be seeing the first slide. Is that correct? Are we all right? Good. Okay. So. So what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about policies for decarbonizing uh, the light duty vehicle fleet in the United States. So I'm going to focus on the US uh, because that's what I know the most about and it's an interesting, uh, interesting situation. Uh, there's, there are some, there are a, a small number of good papers that tackle this question at a at a high level, you know, how do we actually do this? There's a there's a all, sort of a larger literature uh, that focuses on EVs and EV penetration, um, costs and challenges of electric vehicle adoption. Uh, so this fits into that literature. Uh, but I think what I'm going to do is basically draw on draw on that literature and develop a, a model that's going to allow me to make some quantitative statements about decarbonization. And by doing that, you're gonna, we're gonna sort of see, I think, what important next steps in the research program might be. Okay, so let's see. So I just, so we should be moving forward in the slide deck. Yes, Sefi? Okay, good. All right, great. So let me just give you some background. Uh, for those of you who work on different topics or work in the EU, I'm just gonna give you some background on US emissions just for a second to set the stage. <clears throat> So uh, the transportation sector now is the largest emitting sector in the United States. It used to be electricity, but over the last uh, eight years or so, we've transitioned away from coal-fired generation to natural gas and now have a, a, a fair amount or a, mo a modest amount of wind and solar entering the system. Uh, but the main, the main effect has been transition away from coal to natural gas. Um, and although we have some coal left in the system, it's down about 60%. And so that's um, reduced the emissions in electricity uh, and reduced overall emissions in the economy. Uh, transportation now is the leading sector. Within transportation, the leading area is light duty vehicles. So 58% of transportation emissions in the United States are light duty vehicles. There was some discussion, it's worth just, I, I kind of like this pie chart here. Uh, it, it, it lays out uh, the medium and heavy duty trucks. And actually I might say a few words about medium duty trucks. I don't have anything at all to say about heavy duty trucks. Uh, air is 10% uh, in the United States of transportation emissions. And I might say just a couple of words about air down the road. Um, but the interesting thing, uh, the useful thing to keep in mind is that transportation is the biggest and within transportation, light duty vehicles are the biggest. So clearly that's the first step uh, in thinking about decarbonization. Uh, uh, or an important first step, an important step in thinking about decarbonization. The Energy Information Administration, which is a U.S. agency, uh, it produces uh, something called its Annual Energy Outlook. The 2021 version, which was released uh, in early February, uh, has uh, some projections that are useful in terms of uh, light duty vehicles and in terms of the transportation sector. So this is energy for transport. And what you can see is that they, after the COVID stuff gets over, uh, they project that energy for transport is gonna be roughly constant over the next 30 years. And the reason for that is that you have increasing demand for transport as the economy grows, but their baseline reference projection 
of economic growth is you know pretty standard, which is not not great economic growth over the next 30 years, sort of in, in line with the average growth rate over the last 20 years and with in line with aging demographics and so forth. And at the same time, ongoing efficiency improvements roughly at a pace that we've had historically, and those two things offset each other, happen to offset each other, so that uh, total, total uh, energy consumption happens to be roughly constant. Their projection, the, the worrying slide here, the worrying chart is, uh, is the one in the lower right, which is the Energy Information Administration's reference scenario or baseline scenario, business as usual scenario for emissions of CO2 from transportation. And what you can see is that it too is roughly constant. So their baseline, of course, you know, we're, we have committed, uh, we are in the process of committing to Paris reductions of about 50% by 2030. And the, there's a lot of emphasis on the world committing to net zero by 2050. Clearly this is, this is not on that trajectory. Uh, and uh, we could go into reasons within the EIA projection why that is, but it's a, you know, it, it represents a, a, some very thoughtful work by people who are experts uh, that are, uh, that is definitely some cold water on this. So I'm gonna focus on uh, light duty vehicles, which is the main chunk of uh, transportation sector emissions. And I wanna step back before sort of getting into some of the particulars and the modeling, I'd like to step back. Uh, and I, 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 I'm gonna sort of put out there that there seem, I think, it's, I think it's useful, I find it useful. I find it useful to think about two different, I, I, there are almost two different worldviews and how economics and how economic analysis fits into those. And one worldview, which is by far the overwhelming worldview within environmental economics, <clears throat> within the economics profession, is that it's more expensive, it, it, that environment, polluting is cheaper. I mean, that's, it generates externalities. We do it because there's, the prices are wrong. Uh, this dates back you know, to the beginning of the environmental uh, era of, of, health, of environmental health movements. It dates back to the Clean Air Act uh, in Britain in the 50s, the smog, uh, the nitric, nitrogen oxide trading system, uh, SOX trading system in the United States, that basically it's uh, in the Clean Air Act amendments of 1970. Basically, <clears throat> we need to reduce pollutants because they're bad in one way or another, health, benefit, health, health, health problems, but doing so is costly. And so the job of economists is to figure out how to make that done in the least costly way. And in a small area like Knox, for example, or SOX, it's a better example. So a small area like SOX, uh, you can set up a cap and trade system and that's going to reduce pollutants and it's going to incentivize the efficient level of investment and abatement technology. And it's going to cost a little bit more, but as long as you do things as efficiently as possible by setting up the market-based uh, solutions with a cap and trade system, uh, you'll be able to balance the public welfare on one hand and uh, the private costs on the other and reach a, reach a desirable trade-off. And that's going to be welfare maximizing, even though it's going to be costly to a private sense. And that's, that is the overwhelming um, leitmotif of uh, environmental economics. Uh, and we saw that in Rick's terrific paper that he just presented. I mean, that's the, that's the trade-off. There's another worldview, which is kind of the techno-optimist view which is that it's cheaper to be green. Now, of course, the original, you know, what an economist would say is, well, come on, that's ridiculous. If we're cheaper to be green, we'd all be green. So that's like really stupid. That's like a bad, you know, why would you say that? But you know, the more you think about light duty vehicles, the more it gets difficult to, to dismiss that. And, and I would argue that a fundamental question in terms of thinking about economic policy going forward and the, how economists can contribute to solving the climate crisis is, is trying to understand this dichotomy. Where is it going to be cheaper to be green? Or, or is that ever possible? Or are we basically on a path? Are we taking the first steps towards perpetual self-restraint? And you know, when, when you say it that way, 
were taking the steps towards perpetual self-constraint, it doesn't make you super optimistic that we're actually going to solve this problem because we could, you know, some of us might think that we should engage in some self-restraint for a while, but for all of us to engage in self-restraint forever um, is asking a lot. So, okay. So I'm gonna focus on the light duty vehicle fleet. Um, I, I'm gonna suggest, not, not based on my analysis, but based on estimates that are out there, that it might well be the case that we're in this techno-optimist situation where it could actually plausibly, quite plausibly be cheaper uh, to be green in the long run. And if that's the case, then the question is, how, you know, how are we gonna get there? What are the policies for the transition? So I'm gonna talk about that. Um, there's three externalities, the greenhouse gas externality, the innovation externality, and an important one in the transportation sector because of the role of transportation fueling infrastructure is the network externality. And here what I have in mind is um, basically fuel, you know, just as I said, said, fueling infrastructure. So right now, the fueling infrastructure is entirely oriented around um, gasoline powered or diesel powered vehicles. Uh, and, uh, and if we're gonna to transition to let's say EVs, then there needs to be a transition in the fueling infrastructure. If we're gonna to transition to hydrogen powered vehicles and fuel cells, there needs to be a transition in, the, uh, in, in, the, in that infrastructure. And, you, and then that's a sort of a natural chicken and egg, uh, chicken and egg situation. Um, <clears throat> one nice thing about studying the United States is that we don't, is that we have, we, we have an incredibly incoherent uh, and therefore intellectually very engaging system of regulations in this space or policies in this space. At the federal level, we have fuel economy standards, so the corporate average fuel economy standard or the, the safe rule, which is the uh, version of it that was put forward by the Trump administration. It's being it's been peeled or being pulled back and it's gonna be replaced by some new version of the CAFE standards. We have the renewable fuel standards. We have tax credits for blending biodiesel uh, uh, fuel. Um, <clears throat> we have tax credits for purchasing EVs. They're phasing out uh, it depending upon the uh, 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 depending upon the type of EV. We have um, something I'll talk about e-RINs in a little bit. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, subsidies, and we continue to have subsidies for fossil fuel production and fossil fuel for fossil fuels. Uh, various tax credits, enhanced oil recovery tax credits, and so forth. So, um, so uh, we have a we have a mush a mesh of things. I would argue <clears throat> that none of them have been used in a in, are on the table in a really strong way at the moment to affect policy. Uh, and so, there's an opening for thinking about what policies really are important. And the, Biden administration has been thinking about doing that. States have various policies. So there's a low carbon fuel standard uh, in California and some other states. Some Eastern states tried to get something called the Transportation Climate Initiative <clears throat> moving, uh, but that was pretty much unsuccessful. Uh, there's some states have zero emission vehicle mandates. Um, uh, there's much more aggressive policy abroad. So Norway appears to be on the path towards banning internal combustion engines by 2025, the UK at 2030, although I guess it's going to allow hybrids through 2035. I'm not exactly sure on that. It seems to be a moving target. California says they want to ban ICEs by 2035, France by 2040. Um, I might have some of that wrong. This is fairly quickly moving. So I'm gonna think about, uh, so anyway, all, all of this is work in progress. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through, uh, I'm gonna go through um, uh, 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 an overview of, 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 of LDVs and the transition. And then I'm gonna talk about some modeling and, uh, and, uh, and then uh, provide some results. Okay, and you should interrupt. <clears throat> you know, I, I like that, the, the style of it. Um, we're charged or we're this kind of this uh, conference is using. Okay, so prices of EVs have been declining, as everybody knows. The price drops have been spurred by battery price declines. And this picture here on the uh, upper right, uh, this graph <clears throat> uh, basically is just a, a, a it's a heuristic that that gets at this point three different generations of uh, electric vehicles in uh, blue, green, and red. And what you see 
most noticeably is that these lines are getting fat flatter. So this is the manufacturer suggested retail price as a function of range. And, uh, and you can see that the rain, the slope on that is going to reflect, basically reflects battery prices. It's been getting flatter and flatter. Actually, just by coincidence, the rate at which this slope is getting faster is about 16%, which is about the price declines that have been estimated from 2007 through 2009 for battery, for battery packs, for EVs. So I guess it's not a complete coincidence, but uh, this, doesn't, this picture here doesn't control for any other attributes or anything like that, but it kind of, uh, kind of uh, gives, gives, the, gives, the, gives the basic idea. Industry <clears throat> is projecting based on battery price, if batteries hit like 100, the usual term is, you know, if batteries hit about $100, then we should have EV, ICE price parity somewhere down the road. Uh, exactly where depends on um, what you mean by price parity. Do you mean for suggested retail prices? Do you mean by full user costs? Full user costs in most parts of the United States, at least, are much less for EVs because the electricity is less expensive than the gas, and you also need less maintenance expenses for EVs. Um, where I happen to live in Massachusetts, we have, I think, the most expensive, or along with California, the most expensive electricity in the nation. So our price parity point for full user costs would be a little bit later. But I think it's quite reasonable to project that there'll be user price parity uh, in the, you know, the 20, mid 2020s. And that's consistent with a lot of industry projections. Um, of course, there's differences in attributes uh, and differences in, uh, and, and so that's that, and, and there's a lot of difference in understanding and knowledge. I'll come back to this later. Ford, you see in the lower right hand corner, uh, lower right, uh, lower right here. Ford has a very interesting strategy, and I'm going to come back to that at the end. It's actually a very helpful strategy for the econometricians, um, which is that it is taking its most popular vehicles and it is producing an electric version of each of its most popular vehicles. So here is the Ford F-150 <clears throat> truck, which is the highest selling pickup truck in the United States. And on the left is the gasoline version and on the right is the electric version. The electric version is going to be available for sale next year. So it was just uh, demoed in May. So, uh, so that's going to be useful. That's actually Ford's more general strategy to take their best-selling vehicles and then make a EV version of it. Um, you can see why the econometricians like that. You don't really have to control for as many attributes. Um, so how are we doing in terms of penetration? Well, Norway, here I'm just looking at battery electric vehicles. So this ignores the plug-in hybrids. If you add in plug-in hybrids, Norway is at about 80% in April. But if you just look at the BEVs, uh, that's about 55%. UK is about 8% last month. Uh, in the first quarter of this year, UK, the US was um, at a sort of a stodgy 2.5%. So um, the question is, what's going to what's going to happen? Ford and GM have made announcements. Uh, Ford is, you know, doing this 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 big transition. GM has taken a somewhat different strategy. GM has said it's going to stop producing ICEs in 2035. The projections about um, how what the penetration is going to be is all over the map. Um, EIA being the most conservative, EIA thinks that electric vehicles are going to comprise eight percent of new vehicles sold in 2050. Um, Bloomberg New Energy Finance thinks they're going to be about half of new vehicles sold in uh, like in like 2027. So it's uh, uh, all over the map. Sorry, okay. can I ask a quick question because you said yeah. you don't mind interruption, right? So uh, very interesting. I, I was just wondering in terms of penetration, uh, this is out of the cars being sold, but do you have do you know something about the mileage being driven? Uh, so, you know, this is whether for yeah. example, Uber driver are more likely to, to, to do that because I think that what really matters at the end of the day, right? Yeah, so, so that's really important for the transition. That's, so that's important for the amount of CO2 that you emit and that's important for the transition. I'm going to focus on sort of long-term, uh, sort of what do we get to full transition? And by the point of full transition, it doesn't really make any difference if you sort of assume that, you know, they're just going to be used in the same way. I'm not gonna talk about the autonomous vehicles or the ride sharing or any of those sort of nuances because uh, I'm not gonna be able to model them. I would point you towards a very interesting paper uh, by um, 
um, uh, David Rapson and co-authors, uh, I think Eric Muliger, but certainly David Rapson, uh, that looks at um, EV usage in California. So they combined um, uh, registration data with home level uh, ele electric bills and then charging station usage data to try to estimate the amount of electricity that was used on a vehicle by vehicle basis and then aggregate that up to find out the amount of vehicle miles driven by electric vehicles. And what they found uh, based on their historical data was that actually they weren't being driven very much at all, like, like a really like 5,700 miles a year or something. Now, there were a lot of issues there. Uh, and the main one was that most of the vehicles in their data set uh, were, um, were very short range vehicles. So like the Nissan Leaf, that's only good for 70 miles. So you're not gonna do much driving with a Nissan Leaf really. Um, and the Teslas, which had longer mileage, seem to be driven a lot. Um, so there's sort of an identification issue. Is it because people like driving the Teslas or is it because they have longer, you know, uh, bigger batteries or whatever? But, but it's an interesting research program and it does raise some questions about the transition for sure. I'm not going to build that in. I'm not going to, that's going to be one nuance. There are going to be many nuances that are too nuanced for me to deal with here. Thank you. Okay. Um, what I am going to do is I'm going to have a pretty simple stripped down model. Uh, it's going to um, have a sweet choice model of EV demand. Um, and basically, I'm just going to break it down to cars and SUVs. So I'm not going to, I'm only going to have the, the, the margin between cars and SUVs. I'm not going to think about the mileage margin, or the intensive margin. I'm going to focus only on battery electric vehicles, take the view that um, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles are kind of a transitional phenomenon. That might be wrong, or the transition might be 15 years, but, but I, that's just what I'm going to do. Um, and then the other part is I'm going to focus on charging station build-out. So one of the interesting features here is that there's this, um, there's this uh, in principle, and in, indeed in this model, there's the possibility of multiple equilibria. One of them is the low charging station, low EV demand, equilibrium, and one is a high charging station, high EV demand equilibrium, and that would be true at any particular price. So that those, those multiple equilibrium may or may not exist depending on the price. Like if the EVs are really expensive, the upper equilibrium might not exist, but in principle, these two equilibriums are there and they're both um, stable equilibriums in this model. So, uh, so I'm just going to, that's what I'm going to use. I don't, I don't, I, I don't invent, I try to invent as little as possible. I've had to make a few minor modifications because I differentiate level two and level three chargers, but otherwise I'm gonna draw on models and parameters from the literature or sort of be inspired by models and parameters in the literature. I don't wanna blame anyone in the literature for what I do, but I will uh, steal from them liberally. Um, Okay, so there's a ton of uncertainty about all of this, you know, battery price projections and all of those things. And I'm gonna do it, uh, doing hand, try to handle that through some Monte Carlo approach where I'm gonna simulate over lots of stuff like oil price paths and so forth. And I don't know whether that's more useful or not than a scenario-based approach, which is more conventional in this literature, but that's what I'm gonna, I, I find it useful because it categorizes or it gives a, some quantification of the uncertainty, which of course is massive. Um, I'm going to focus on second best policies. Um, and so why is that? Well, I guess I'm kind of interested in policies, you know, in line with the previous, with Rick's discussion or with other discussions here. So I'm kind of interested in policies that actually might happen um, and policies that have been proposed. So in the U.S. context, I'm going to think about policies that either exist through existing regulatory authorities or, or our subsidies. And so subsidies, that's the, the one thing that Congress seems to be okay at doing is giving people money. Uh, so um, so I'll, I'll focus on subsidy programs and ones that exist under regular existing authority and they're ones that have been proposed. Um, and then I'm gonna, and then the cost estimates, uh, let me just say one word on this. I'm gonna refer, refer, report some costs per ton these are not welfare values. And so these are, these are total system costs. Uh, so how much does it cost to, you know, if you, if you do some EVs instead of some ICEs, how much does that cost in a, in a full user uh, rational sense, including electricity and all of that stuff. 
Um, I would say that one important part of EVs is that if you really do get a big expansion of EVs, there's a lot more electricity needed. And that means you're going to have to build out the grid. And, I'll and so that a cost of building out the grid is built into these calculations. I'll explain that in a minute. Okay, so okay, so consumer demand. Uh, so this is this model, uh, the one that the, the, I'm most closely following Springle, although it's very close to the Zhao and, and Li specifications as well. Uh, and so I have a logistic demand system for uh, cars and for SUVs. I don't model, you know, switching between cars and SUVs. Um, so the only thing I model is is if you buy a car switching between drive uh, powertrains or if you buy an SUV switching between powertrains. Um, I'm real, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think that's a big compromise. It might be a compromise. That would be something to model, but I'm just keeping it as simple as possible. Uh, it's going to depend on the relative price. This is a relative price of a, of a, um, of a, of a, of a, of an EV to an ICE. Uh, it's going to depend on the number of level two charging stations. So you need you you. So I'm modeling the consumer as saying you look around uh, and you see how many level two charging stations there actually are out there. Maybe last year, uh, and you see whether they're actually free. Level two charging stations are the ones that you need for overnight charging. Uh, sometimes you can, I mean, most people in the United States and actually most people in Norway, and I would speculate that most people so far in the UK have their own garage if they're purchasing an EV, and then you can install a level two charging station in your own garage. Um, it's not that expensive. I just had a second level two port in, put in for some particular reason in my house and uh, including the electrician and purchasing the unit from Amazon and then purchasing the adapter cord, which I forgot to purchase from Amazon the first time. Uh, the whole thing was uh, $850. So it's not that expensive uh, to put in a level two charger. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, the other one is a level three charging station. And probably the right way to think about that is, uh, is like how, what's the density of level three charging stations? So how many do you need per, uh, per, per mile? So I, this is gonna be just entering in the Neville, another, this is the DC fast charging where you could charge at the moment, like my Chevy Bolt can take an uh, 80% charge in about 20 minutes. So that's the, uh, that's, the, that's, the, um, that's the level three charging station that we use on the highway. So then that's the, that, and then there's the, then there's an attribute term, a, an attribute drift. And so that attribute drift is going to reflect unobserved characteristics, people's worries about EVs, not knowing if the mechanics gonna work or on the positive side, the fact that EVs accelerate much more nicely than, uh, than, uh, than uh, ICEs and so forth. Uh, there's a model of charging station provision, again, taken from the liter literature. So um, this, is, this is just what the, the, I'll refer you to the papers for the derivation of this, um, but the number of level two chargers depends on how many um, EVs there are out there and it depends on the cost. Uh, number of level three chargers depends on its cost. Uh, I'm gonna just give you one very cool picture, which is this is just a plot uh, to, to justify the log log specification. This is, you know, casual. Uh, this is an equilibrium outcome in a very mature industry. This is the log of gas stations versus the log of registered out, uh, autos. If it were directly proportional, the slope would be one. It's actually a coefficient of 0.84, uh, and this is across U.S. states. So it's um, it's pretty cool actually that you get such a strong linear relationship uh, and not a coefficient of, of one. In any event. That's, that's sort of consistent with this. At least it doesn't provide evidence against it. Um, I calibrate these things uh, in such a way, I, this, I just need to have some calibrations. Um, it, one of the challenges with level two charging stations and deep penetration is that although many of us have the luxury of having our own garages so that we can install our own level two charging station, there are quite a few people who don't. So if you live, live in an apartment building, you live in an urban setting, even if you own your own home in an urban setting, you might not have a location to park your car 
uh, you might have to be parking on the street and you might not have the ability to uh, install a dedicated level two charger. So there's gonna be needs for level two chargers that are gonna be available at the public level. Exactly how many of those are and where those are is really, really an almost unresearched, within the economics literature, unresearched topic. Um, and I mean, there's some engineering estimates, but it's very sparse actually at this point. Um, I'm gonna just mod for modeling purpose, assume that I need to have uh, 20, 60,000 uh, level two, level three charging stations uh, nationally. And those are major installations. Those are not, not outlets, but these are something where they have 10 outlets uh, per, per stage. So think gas station here. Uh, and that I'm estimating that's about a half a million dollars. Uh, that um, is based on the literature that might be too small. Um, uh, gosh, a bunch of parameterizations, and uh, I'm, I might just skip over this. There's a, the parameters are all drawn from the literature. Oh, one thing, yeah, let me just make one point, which is that in terms of prices, so um, I'm looking, we're gonna look at user costs on prices, and the user cost is two things. It's how much do you pay for the vehicle up front or buy it on its credit or something like that, you know, installment payments, how much do you pay for the vehicle, but then how much do you pay for actual operations and maintenance, which means gasoline or electricity prices. And there's a big debate, a big debate, which I, I'm not going to weigh in on uh, in the literature about how much people really take on board the, uh, the gasoline prices when they make decisions about internal combustion engines. And if, if zero is not at all, and one is you completely take it on, you can find any estimate you want in the range of zero to one in this literature. Um, I think that this is a good paper, the Gillingham paper, Gillingham et al. paper, and they have quite low estimates. But on the other hand, you know, Penny Goldberg's paper is quite good, and she has high ones. And uh, I mean, there's, it's, I'm, I'm just going to do a simulation over that on the range of 0.5 to one. Uh, but it's, this is a, this, I'm happy to have any advice on that. That's, that's hard. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Odds and ends. Uh, I'm only going to, I'm only going to, let me just mention one or two odds and ends. So I do some oil price simulations also in this. Um, let me talk about the power sector. This is actually quite important. Um, and I'll show you a plot on that in a minute. Uh, power sector. Um, uh, if you expand the vehicle fleet so that you increase total demand for electricity by, let's just say, 15%, then you're going to have to actually increase the capacity of the power sector by 15% to, to do at, at least 15% to do that. Um, uh, and so then, then, then what's the marginal emission when you do that? So we're going to have as a baseline scenario that this is coupled with a transition to a clean power sector in the United States. So the philosophy of the electrify everything concept is that you electrify everything while you are making or after you have made the power sector clean so that when you electrify homes and when you electrify electric vehicles, you're actually doing it with low emissions, uh, ideally zero emissions, but low emissions power. And so we're gonna build that in. So we're gonna get marginal power system costs and our marginal power system emissions. So we get marginal costs and marginal emissions from the power sector for this expansion of electric vehicles and to do that, we're going to draw on results. I'm going to use results from previous work with um, Dan Stewart, uh, who just got his PhD uh, at Harvard, um, where we use the Reeds model to model a tradable performance standard, which would take effect shortly uh, and would achieve 80% emission reductions by, 2000, uh, by 2030, 90% by 2035, and 100% by 2050. As a comparison, an alternative is suppose we simply don't do anything and suppose that we're just stuck at the current emissions rates. Uh, there's a very nice, very recent paper by Holland, Koch, and Manser, and Yates that estimates a marginal emissions rate uh, for the power sector uh, if you, uh, if you um, a marginal emissions rate for the power sector. Uh, and I'll use that marginal emissions rate as a counterfactual. Uh, just to presage those results, you'll see that it makes a world of difference. <laughs> Not surprisingly, if you have a lot of EVs, 
um, it makes a world of difference whether or not those are clean electrons or dirty electrons. Okay. Um, okay, okay. Uh, let's look at some policies. So I'm gonna look at a variety of different policies. Uh, one of uh, the baseline has uh, some fairly standard expectations of what CAFE standards are going to be. I'm gonna look at then a number of different uh, uh, active policies. One is gonna be subsidizing charging stations. So that's gonna be a 50% cost share for level two and a 75% cost share for level three uh, for the next six years. And then it just has a hard stop. So the, it's, these are just sort of toy policies. I'm gonna have an instant or a point of sale showroom rebate. So the, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, President's American Jobs Plan has proposed a point of sale showroom rebate. I'm gonna model it as being about as being $5,000 uh, for the next uh, through 2026 and then winding down for a couple of years. Uh, the specific one that's probably, if, if anything passes, it's likely that one, would, one that would pass would have a uh, MSRP ceiling so that you're only, or a phase out so that you're only eligible for cars under a certain level. Most recent number I heard was something like $75,000. So it doesn't seem to me to be a particularly stringent phase out, uh, but, but I don't model that at all. There's something completely obscure. So for those of you who, um, those of you who follow the micro minutia of the renewable fuel standard in the United States, you might be familiar with the E-RIN concept, which is a way to generate a subsidy for electric vehicle owners um, using the renewable fuel standard where you generate biogas, it becomes electricity, and then magically an EV owner gets a quarterly check. And so in the I'm going to, I'm going to model that. Okay. So I'm going to model that. And if anyone wants to know more, it's great fun. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and there's a lot of interesting, so a lot of interesting weeds there, uh, but it is actually on the table. And I would, I would, I, I think the general expectation, uh, is, well, it's not quite clear. I mean, many, the sort of the, sort of the, 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 the narrow group that follows this suggests that maybe, we hear something about EPA proposing that this summer, um, but we're not, it's not clear that hasn't been done. We look at a combination of that. It's gonna turn out that this really doesn't do the trick. Okay, so this can stimulate initial vehicle sales and it certainly stimulates charging stations, but it actually doesn't result in deep decarbonization or it doesn't result in complete decarbonization or complete transformation by 2050. So I'm gonna consider some additional belts and suspenders on top of that. So one of them is Clean Air Act regulation. In the United States, there's actually two regulatory authorities, uh, two regulatory, two, two authorities that, can, that are used right now, they're combined. So one is the EPA authority under the Clean Air Act, and the other is the Department of Transportation Authority under um, Environmental Policy and Something Act, uh, EPCA. And, um, and those, the, the former uh, controls emissions of dangerous pollutants, and CO2 is one of them. And this, the latter controls fuel economy from internal combustion engines. Those have been synchronized so that current US um, uh, CAFE standards actually coordinate on both of these two policies. They don't have to be, they could be separated. And so I'm gonna imagine separating them so that there's a regulatory standard on emissions from internal combustion engines through the DOT EPCA authority. And then there's going to be also a um, also uh, a, 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 a Clean Air Act regulation, which would be implemented in the way that many that other standards uh, are sometimes implemented, which is simply, are you clean or are you not? And so that would be like a zero emission vehicle or a ZEV standard implemented under Clean Air Act authority. That might not be how it would be done, but it's an easy thing to model. I'm gonna assume there's gonna be a tradable allowance under that. So there's a tradable allowance under the uh, ZEV standard. And uh, that's the way that's the way it would actually, uh, I would, in, in the modeling, that's how it's implemented. And I'm imposing an allowance price cap of 15,000, which is an enormous amount of money. No vehicle actually pays that full $15,000. You pay it weighted towards times um, the EV or the uh, times the sale share of either EVs or 
um, ICEs. But it's a big, it's a big, it's a high cap. Um, I'll look at a carbon tax, and then I'm going to look at a combination of a charging station subsidy and a Clean Air Act regulation. All right, so let me just show you a few of these simulation results. So the gray here is the baseline, and I've calibrated the baseline so that you get reasonable but incomplete, moderate but incomplete, I don't know, moderate, I don't know, it depends on people's perspective. I'm sorry, let's look at the EV share. I've calibrated it. I've calibrated it. You're looking at the EV share. I've calibrated it so that you so that you get substantial penetration of new vehicles, um, like by about 88 percent by or 90 93 percent by 2050, and about 80 some 78 percent by 2040, but incomplete. So that's just the calibration. And the question is, what happens on top of that? You can see the gray is the is the baseline. The, is the gray baseline Monte Carlos? And there's a lot of uncertainty around, around those uh, penetration rates. The red is under the um, charging station cost share. So you can see as you bump up, the, as you make the charging stations really cheap, I mean, a 75% cost share is a big cost share. You can see a lot of them are built. Um, and then after the program ends, no more are built. And then there's some catch up. And, and what you do see though, is you see that because there's more chargers out there, People are happy about that. So they're more comfortable buying their EVs. And so you see an, a bump up in EVs, but you don't actually, you end up in this modeling setup, you end up back at this, um, you end up back on the same equilibrium path uh, uh, in, the, in the longer run. And um, so, so what this does is it expedites, uh, expedites early adoption, but it actually doesn't um, stimulate uh, long-term adoption because you only, it only build part, partly build the EV, partly build the charging stations. And then once you sort of get to the point when that's the right number, you're then kind of on this other uh, unsubsidized equilibrium. It, the one, the charging station program I've looked at costs about eight, 15 to $20 billion uh, on a cost per ton basis. It's somewhere in the $100 uh, per ton range. So, um, you know, higher than a $50 social cost per carbon, but not higher than a lot of estimates of the social cost of carbon. I've eliminated the Monte Carlo simulation uncertainty for some of these because there's the effects are so small that you wouldn't see them at all. Um, this is the point of sale rebate and the point of sale rebate has some effect. I'm using a baseline elasticity, cross price elasticity of 2.5, which um, is within the, which is, I think a plausible central value based on the range of estimates that are in the literature. There is a ton of uncertainty about what that is. And I think we could have, we need to have much better understanding of what that cross price elasticity is. But based on that cross price elasticity, you see that this is a pretty substantial subsidy, but it, it is only making a bit of a blip. It has an induced blip on charging stations. It also costs in the hundred to $150 per ton range. Uh, but it doesn't have um, a particularly big effect. It's very expensive. It's like $100 billion. So it's spending a lot of money, but um, not getting a lot, of, uh, a, lot, a lot of tons and not getting a lot of um, vehicles. Uh, the ERAN is worthless uh, in terms of actually getting anything, getting anything done. I, I can explain that if anyone's curious. Um, Okay, so what if you what if you do all three of those things at once? Uh, you see some pretty pretty substantial effects. It actually costs more than the sum is more than the individual parts. There's interaction because as you build out more charging stations, there's more demand for EVs. Those people would buy them anyway, but now you're going to give them five thousand bucks. So there's a lot of inframarginal uh, benefit, a lot of inframarginal gains here. This is a two hundred billion dollar program. Uh, it produces uh, more, uh, more. It's 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 a you know hundred dollar a ton program, but it's a very expensive fiscal program. Um, it produces a much some more substantial EV penetration initially. Uh, carbon tax by Do itself they, is please. Um, yeah, quick question. Uh, you mentioned earlier that there was a trade off between how fast we can decarbonize the grid. Um, and uh, how fast we, uh, we have electric vehicles on the road, right? And your graph your pre in the previous slide, right? The policy intervention kind of increased massively in the short term, the number of electric vehicles, which is also 
this time where the grid is not going to be great to decarbonize, or at least not to an extent that we would like. And on the other hand, the long term uh, curves are overlapped, overlap completely, which means like we, we don't even get a positive benefit of that policy when the grid will have decarbonized, right? So this is that's a, that is an excellent point, and that's actually the reason why these policies are in the hundred dollar or more range because you're spending a fair amount but you're not getting as much cleanliness if you will now or at this point as you would later and so in just a second i'm going to show you some policies that take effect later like the clean air act policy and you'll see that its cost per ton are much lower because at that point you're actually getting a lot more tons for your you know uh for the for exactly that reason and similarly, you know, it might make sense in, in a first best optimal situation, which is not the situation that we're in with the US Congress, but in the first best optimal situation, you know, it might make sense to, to think about postponing this later until uh, the power sector is somewhat cleaner. That's a, that's, yes. Okay, so. Um, Can I ask something about, so if I see this correctly, then the, the, uh, the charging stations is an important, sort of effect. Um, but I, I wonder a little bit, I, I mean, can we really interpret your estimates you showed earlier as causal? Because it depends very much on that, right? That, that they're really causal estimates. It might well be that the charging stations came kind of after, you know, the people, but there were some people in an area who really wanted yeah. Uh, so, bought their Teslas and it's the rich areas. I mean, in, I'm thinking of London, right? So the first charging stations are probably in South Kensington where the people bought their Teslas and, and, and it's sort of, at first you needed a great cause. And, you know, I, I wonder a little bit, you know, maybe that money you spend on the charging stations, the sort of big alternative would be, maybe that is better spent on solid state batteries research or something like that, to get the cars and then the charging stations follow. Uh, so. Sure, so this is not, so, so I think coming up with some first best thing where we endogenize, where we have some model of learning uh, or uh, where we have some model of R&D would be really great. That would be great. That would be great. Okay, so that would be great. Um, the endogeneity of the charging stations, that's actually quite an important question. Um, I didn't discuss that at all. I'm taking estimates from the literature. There are two papers that are, uh, there are two papers that I'm aware of that estimate um, demand, uh, the, the estimate a joint charging system uh, demand for vehicle model. One of them is the Zhao and Li paper, or, from, or a pair of papers. And then another one is the Springle paper, which is a J, uh, policy forthcoming. And they use IP estimates, and they seem to me to be pretty plausible. Uh, there are lots of challenges thinking about what credible IVs would be. Um, so, but you know, I think they do a good job. Both of the papers do. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is that the Zhao and Li papers are based on data from like 2013. So they have tiny penetration rates and everything is like very special uh, in the US. And then the Springle paper is based on Norway where there's somewhat more penetration, but it's still or early Norwegian data, but it's Norwegian. So I don't know how well that generalizes to the United States. So like, more research is needed, but they're both they're both good papers given the challenges that you know the challenges, and they definitely try to take that into account. Uh, Taking so I'm going to treat these as causal. They're certainly causal in my model. The question is whether they're good estimates. Of, there are good estimates out there of the causal effects. Okay, um, here's what happens if you um, enhance Clean Air Act standards, uh, and so you'll see. Uh, as Jenny was pointing out, uh, this actually has a very different profile. So um, the way I've modeled it is that those standards actually start to uh, take effect. They start to take effect in about in the late 2020s. So I've I've just put in as a dem as a heuristic an S curve uh, penetration an S curve requirement um, for a ZEV mandate uh, under the Clean Air Act. And so this is, these are now following that ZEV mandate. The reason there's any variation around this is that I put in a price cap. So if there were no variation, we would follow the ZEV mandate exactly, um, but, um, and prices could go crazy. But I put in a price of a tradable performance standard, uh, excuse me, a tradable um, allowance 
a price cap. So that means there's a fair amount of variation around, around this. But you can see that that actually happens later. Uh, and because it happens later, the emissions reductions occur later when the power sector is cleaner. And what that means is the cost per ton is now actually quite low. So the, these costs per ton are zero to $50. And it's happening, they're cheaper for two reasons. One is that the, the vehicles, the EVs are cheaper by that point. And on top of that, the power sector is cleaner. So uh, uh, this later policy is more cost effective. We do find that you hit the price cap in almost all simulations uh, for a fair number of years. I'm going to come back that, and then you know whether that's politically viable to have a fifteen thousand dollar tradable allowance price cap, which might translate into ten thousand dollars per vehicle for a, for an ICE. Um, I don't know. Maybe I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, I mean. UK, forget about price caps, just says no. So I don't know, maybe it's easier to say no than to say you have to pay $10,000, I don't know. Uh, in any event, um, if you combine the charging station cost share and the Clean Air Act standards, you can pretty reliably get to deep, deep, you know, for deep, deep penetration, 90% plus by 2040 and maybe by 2035, 85% plus. So deep BEV penetration. Uh, with these two, uh, the cost per ton is actually quite low, um, and uh, and that's for the various reasons that we've uh, the various reasons that we've discussed. The total fiscal cost is quite low just from the charging stations. Okay, so these are just some examples. Uh, I'm going to skip this. Um, I will say one thing, which is I want to one thing quickly. If you decide if, if for some reason we decide in the United States not to clean up the power sector, but to transform uh, transform uh, the vehicle fleet, or that maybe that just happens by default, like, you know, EVs become cheap and people like their performance, but we buy, don't bother cleaning up the power sector. That's like a mess. Uh, and the policy is to build charging stations. Uh, here's the example of the charging station policy. Uh, if you don't clean up the power sector, and now we're looking at thousand dollars a ton, and that's because you're just not getting, you're spending a bunch of money, and you're not getting any tons for it. So it's, uh, uh, I mean, this doesn't say anything that we shouldn't already know, but it's very important to keep this in mind uh, in terms of reading the literature on these marginal emission rates. Is that of course our, we're not in the power system that we need to be in in ten or fifteen or twenty years. Okay, so there is a ton more work that should be done here. Uh, we need to have a better understanding of the cross price elasticity. All of this becomes much easier if the cross price, if, if there's a high cross price elasticity. Ford is doing the work for us um, on that. It is um, introducing the electric version of the F-150. It is introducing the electric version of the Mustang. It is introducing the electric version of the transit van. This is the, the F-150 is the best-selling pickup in the United States. The Mustang is the best-selling uh, sports car in the United States. And the Transit is the best-selling uh, delivery van in the United States. So, you know, uh, we might be able to get a good sense on those cross-price cross, cross price elasticities pretty soon. Um, there's a ton more work that needs to be done. And I just have a list here. Um, I, think, I think that one lesson that and this is built, built in, I guess, and you can see this in the spring of work is that the charging station infrastructure plays a critical role. Uh, I think that the, the comments about timing are great ones. Uh, this has not made any attempt at all at coming out with first best policies. That would be a useful exercise and would help guide the discussion. So I, I think that would be an obvious next step is to take a model like this and to think about first best policies. There's, some nice, there's a nice paper coming out in AG Economic Policy uh, uh, by um, uh, uh, Manser and others, uh, ha uh, Holland Manser and, and two others uh, uh, on uh, uh, one other, Yates, I guess, on uh, first best policy in this transition in a related, you know, even more stylized model than this one that doesn't have any charging stations uh, in the baseline model. Uh, and I think that's, I think this is an area that just needs a whole lot more, a whole lot more work. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, James. We, we have a 
a tiny bit of more time for uh, for question if if anyone uh, has any uh, feel free to just uh, unmute yourself and, and ask uh, can I ask a question can you hear me yeah go ahead Matt. yeah thank thanks Jim interesting presentation I just want to go back to that sort of big thing question you also posed earlier about the techno optimist versus the cynical um, economist and how we think about it yeah, and because it really amplifies like what we spend all our time studying and what all the politicians actually say in order to sell these policies. And I'm just wondering a question for you or maybe like for others in the group, are there examples in the past where we actually have had breakthroughs that have made it so that it answers the question at least that you're posing it? I don't know, maybe this is just a recasting of like the Porter hypothesis literature, but I'm just wondering if there are examples where it actually has been cheaper to be green. Well, you know, natural gas and fracking is the first one that comes to mind. So, I mean, that, that transition has occurred totally through the private sector with a little bit of government R&D help. Maybe here, I guess, LEDs as well. Maybe, uh, yeah. I mean, obviously there are behavioral issues in uh, uh, adoption. Um, LEDs is an interesting question. I have a, a there's an excellent PhD student will be on the market next year from Harvard, Sarah Armitage, who has um, been studying this. There are there ha, there were important policy standards um, pushing the pushing the market. At the same time, there was a lot of exogenous technical change. So um, I think this, the the policy did have a role. But yes, in the end where we got to was a point where it was cheaper to be green in that case. We have time for one more question, if anyone has. I guess, um, if I may, yeah, I, I'd like to just um, uh, ask about the, the sort of learning by doing uh, and, and, you know, what difference, whether we could speculate as to what difference that might make to the costs of the near term policies um, Jim, I wonder if you, I know you don't, you're not able to factor that in, I can quite understand that, but I wonder if you had a sort of a, you know, a, a sense of how much difference that might make. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think that actually could be pretty important. I guess you'd have to calibrate it in terms of the U.S. contribution to the international market, because the right. learning by doing is really going to be an international thing. Um, but I mean, my, my intuition is that that's, that that's gotta be a really big deal. And certainly in the battery space, that's been part of why we, you know, that plus economies of scale is why we've seen things come down so much. So, and that's gotta, I think that's one of the unsatisfying things I have in the long run, you know, the short-term policy is converging to the same long run path. And that doesn't really feel right because we're not taking advantage of expediting the learning by doing. So I, I, I think that's gotta be an important extension. Yeah, although you, the, your paths that um, give you um, sort of higher adoption and reduced emissions in the short term will, will give you lower cumulative emissions, I guess, over the, the period. So that it's even though you get the long term, even though they catch up, they're still environmentally inferior. Um, it depends on what's happening in the power sector. So right. what well, okay, yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing about the thing about our um, power sector modeling is that in the United States, there's a whole bunch of coal plants that are right on the margin that are actually used for cycling right now. And if you have even a really modest standard or a modest implicit price on carbon, either through, well, either explicit or through a performance standard or a trade, tradable system, those things, they just drop out. So you actually get um, those marginal emission rates in the Mansur, Koch, and Holland, Yates paper um, really drop very quickly if you start putting a price on uh, coal, basically. And, and that just is a, an, a feature of how it happens to be in the U.S. system. So you actually, so the, the, so the so, so emissions by 2026 are actually, marginal emissions are actually quite half the, what they are right now, uh, if, you have a, if you have a policy in place. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Jim, for uh, this uh, great uh, presentation. Uh, guys, we're going to come back at 15 past the hour. So you have around 12 minutes to go quickly to the bathroom and get a coffee or whatever you need to do. And we will be uh, back here uh, very shortly with another great session. Thank you very much. Thank you.